Chapter 1. There is no lake at Camp Green Lake. There once was a very large lake here, the largest lake in Texas. That was over a hundred years ago. Now it is just a dry, flat wasteland. There used to be a town of Green Lake, as well. The town shriveled and dried up along with the lake, and the people who live there. During the summer the daytime temperature hovers around 95 degrees in the shade if you can find any shade. There's not much shade in a big dry lake. The only trees are two old oaks on the eastern edge of the lake. A hammock is stretched between the two trees and a log cabin stands behind that. The campers are forbidden to lie in the hammock. It belongs to the warden. The warden owns the shade. Out on the lake, rattlesnakes and scorpions find shade under rocks and in the holes dug by the campers. Here's a good rule to remember about rattlesnakes and scorpions. If you don't bother them, they won't bother you. You Being bitten by a scorpion or even a rattlesnake is not the worst thing that can happen to you. You won't die. Usually, sometimes a camper will try to be bitten by a scorpion or even a small rattlesnake. Then he will get to spend a day or two recovering in his tent instead of having to dig a hole out on the lake. But you don't want to be bitten by a yellow spotted lizard. That's the worst thing that can happen to you. You will die a slow and painful death. Always. If you get bitten by a yellow spotted lizard, you might as well go into the shade of the oak trees and lie in the hammock. There is nothing anyone can do to you anymore. Chapter 2 The reader is probably asking why would anyone go to Camp Green Lake? Most campers weren't given a choice. Camp Green Lake is a camp for bad boys if you take a bad boy and make him dig a hole every day in the hot sun, it will turn him into a good boy. That was what some people thought. Stanley Yelmitz was given a choice. The judge said, you may go to jail, or you may go to Camp Green Lake. Stanley was from a poor family. He had never been to camp before. Chapter 3 Stanley Yelmitz was the only passenger on the bus, not counting the driver or the guard. The guard sat next to the driver with his seat turned around facing Stanley. A rifle lay across his lap. Stanley was sitting about ten rows back, handcuffed to his armrest. His backpack lay on the seat next to him. It contained his toothbrush, toothpaste, and a box of stationery his mother had given him he'd promised to write to her at least once a week. He looked out the window. Although there wasn't much to see mostly fields of hay and cotton, he was on a long bus ride to know where the bus wasn't air-conditioned, and the hot, heavy air was almost as stifling as the handcuffs. Stanley and his parents had tried to pretend that he was just going away to camp for a while, just like rich kids do. When Stanley was younger, he used to play with stuffed animals and pretend the animals were at camp. Camp fun and games, he called it. Sometimes he'd have them play soccer with a marble. Other times they'd run an obstacle course or go bungee jumping off a table, tied to broken rubber bands. Now Stanley tried to pretend he was going to camp fun and games. Maybe he'd make some friends, he thought. At least he'd get to swim in the lake. He didn't have any friends at home. He was overweight and the kids at his middle school often teased him about his size. Even his teachers sometimes made cruel comments without realizing it. On his last day of school, his math teacher, Mrs. Bell, taught ratios. As an example, she chose the heaviest kid in the class, and the lightest kid in the class, and had them weigh themselves. Stanley weighed three times as much as the other boy Mrs. Bell wrote the ratio on the board, three, one, unaware of how much embarrassment she had caused both of them. Stanley was arrested later that day. He looked at the guard who sat slumped in his seat and wondered if he had fallen asleep. The guard was wearing sunglasses, so Stanley couldn't see his eyes. Stanley was not a bad kid. He was innocent of the crime for which he was convicted. He'd just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was all because of his no-good dirty rotten pig stealing great-great-grandfather. He smiled. It was a family joke. Whenever anything went wrong, they always blamed Stanley's no-good dirty rotten pig stealing great-great-grandfather. Supposedly, he had a great-great-grandfather who had stolen a pig from a one-legged gypsy, and she put a curse on him, and all his descendants. Stanley and his parents didn't believe in curses, of course, but whenever anything went wrong, it felt good to be able to blame someone. Things went wrong a lot. They always seemed to be in the wrong place, at the wrong time. He looked out the window at the vast emptiness. He watched the rise and fall of a telephone wire. 
In his mind he could hear his father's gruff voice softly singing to him. Stanley was not a bad kid. He was innocent of the crime for which he was convicted. He'd just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. If only, if only, the woodpecker sighs. The bark on the tree was just a little bit softer. While the wolf waits below, hungry and lonely, he cries to the moon on, if only, if only. It was a song his father used to sing to him. The melody was sweet and sad, but Stanley's favorite part was when his father would howl the word moon. The bus hit a small bump and the guard sat up, instantly alert. Stanley's father was an inventor. To be a successful inventor, you need three things, intelligence, perseverance, and just a little bit of luck. Stanley's father was smart and had a lot of perseverance. Once he started a project, he would work on it for years, often going days without sleep. He just never had any luck. Every time an experiment failed, Stanley could hear him cursing his dirty, rotten pig, stealing great grandfather. Stanley's father was also named Stanley Yelnuts. Stanley's father's full name was Stanley Yelnuts III. Our Stanley is Stanley Yelnitz IV. Everyone in his family had always liked the fact that Stanley Yelnitz was spelled the same frontward and backward. So they kept naming their son Stanley. Stanley was an only child, as was every other Stanley Yelnitz before him. All of them had something else in common. Despite their awful luck, they always remained hopeful. As Stanley's father liked to say, I learned from failure. But perhaps that was part of the curse as well. If Stanley and his father weren't always hopeful, then it wouldn't hurt so much every time their hopes were crushed. Not every Stanley Yelnitz has been a failure, Stanley's mother often pointed out, whenever Stanley or his father became so discouraged that they actually started to believe in the curse. The first Stanley Yelnitz, Stanley's great-grandfather, had made a fortune in the stock market. He couldn't have been too unlucky. At such times she neglected to mention the bad luck that befell the first Stanley Yelnitz. He lost his entire fortune when he was moving from New York to California. His stagecoach was robbed by the outlaw kissing Kate Barlow. If it weren't for that, Stanley's family would now be living in a mansion on a beach in California. Instead, they were crammed in a tiny apartment that smelled of burning rubber and foot odor. If only, if only. The apartment smelled the way it did because Stanley's father was trying to invent a way to recycle old sneakers. The first person who finds a use for old sneakers, he said, will be a very rich man. It was this latest project that led to Stanley's arrest. The bus ride became increasingly bumpy because the road was no longer paved. Actually, Stanley had been impressed when he first found out that his great-grandfather was robbed by kissing Kate Barlow. True, he would have preferred living on the beach in California, but it was still kind of cool to have someone in your family robbed by a famous outlaw. Kate Barlow didn't actually kiss Stanley's great-grandfather. That would have been really cool, but she only kissed the men she killed. Instead, she robbed him and left him stranded in the middle of the desert. He was lucky to have survived, Stanley's mother was quick to point out. The bus was slowing down. The guard grunted as he stretched his arms. Welcome to Camp Green Lake, said the driver. Stanley looked out the dirty window. He couldn't see a lake. And hardly anything was green.